Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Today's guest, Seabass of WNWS of Jackson, Tennessee. Our podcast presented by Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will wow your team or your clients. We also thank our co-sponsor, the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. Today's news presented by Sutherland and Belk, an SEC sports-loving injury firm in Nashville. These folks will shoot you straight on your rights and options when you've been injured in an accident. Call them at 615-846-6200 to get your questions answered. You can visit them online at sbinjurylaw.com. Well, not much news to report at the moment. The Commodores have the weekend off in basketball as exams are set, I think, for next week. Our guest line presented by Bolin Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I've slept on their sheets for years. They're phenomenal. I had no clue what I was missing till I got them. They are fair trade certified, meaning they're made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them free for a month. You can return them, but you won't want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress which was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to bowlandbranch.com, enter the promo code VANDY, help the site out, help yourself out with a $50 discount as well. Seabass is with us on the Friday late night edition of the podcast. Our friend had a personal matter to take care of earlier in the day that pushed us back after getting pushed back from Wednesday or whenever we do this. Uh, let's start with this. Have you killed anyone today? No, I, but I'll tell you like this. I'm like uh, Cool Mo D said. I go to work, Jack. I got my business handled. You can believe that. Uh, uh, man, I tell you what. It's a Friday night. I just got off the air, and I'm ready to just sit back. and I, let, me tell you, let me paint the scene for you, Chris, if you don't mind. I got two lazy hounds eating their treats on their beds laying here in the living room, and I got diners, drive-ins, and dives on mute, ready to go. And I'm ready to do a good I, – I'm, I, I'm ready to do a fun podcast tonight, and I just happened to go on the website. I almost never see any of the mailbag questions beforehand, and I didn't, I didn't read any of them tonight, but I did see that there's a whole bunch of them. There are a whole bunch of them, and uh, let me start. I miss dogs, man. Riley died, oh, I believe man. it was November 11th of 2017, so I'm coming up on two years. Well, let me just say that you're on speakerphone right now, and they can hear you, so just don't say nothing crazy if you know what I mean. But you can say something, though. Don't say nothing. <laughs> well, I, I can say things, but when the mute button is on, no one can hear me. <laughs> Why, why do I get the feeling oh, it is why? going to be that kind of night? Bring it on. Bring it <laughs> on, son. I am ready. I'm going to start with a little exercise. What is one plus one? Come on. One plus one. This should be a trick question, but the only answer I know is two. What is two plus two? I'll play your game four. What is four plus four? <laughs> How do you make a four? Okay, I'm going to go with eight. What is eight plus eight? Sixteen. What's your or name of vegetable? Name of vegetable. I'm going to go with a Rutabaga. Of course you are. Did you know 90% <laughs> of people say carrot in that situation? I wonder why. I don't know. My daughter did that on me, and I said carrot. Let me ask you a question. Did you expect me to say carrot? No, not really. <laughs> exactly. Now, I do have to say this. I I'm pretty sure I know the answers, but a rutabaga is a vegetable, right? I would have to look that up. Except I, I don't know how to spell it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't either. Gosh, what? I don't either, what? so... Uh, Where's this going to go tonight? Oh man, so many deep dark places. Well, so many, and and that was 
an illustration just to start to say psychology is just an interesting subject, and I'm more fascinated by it with every passing day. Yeah, man, then I'm your guy. Believe it. I'm your. I'm your. I'm your guinea pig. Do what you do. Well. Just don't hypnotize me. I don't want to wake up in the morning on Briley Parkway wearing nothing but a left sock. <laughs> I don't think I can do that from yeah. 150 miles away. But <laughs> uh, if right, I can, I could, I could make some money from that, which I will not be able to make from you know, a 2020 football season. But anyway. You know, you know uh, <laughs> what, what's, what's going to be interesting to see, because I never know, y'all, uh, what Chris is going to name these podcasts. But it's always usually some little snippet from like something that we said in the in the podcast. It's usually a little off the wall. There's no telling what this podcast name's gonna be. My favorite two snippets from this year um, were "Sexy Pete" and "The Funnel uh-huh. of Love." <laughs> <laughs> sexy, sexy Pete, sexy yeah, Pete was... still makes me laugh. I will just be out mowing the yeah. yard or raking leaves, and that just randomly brings a smile to my face. How would you do if you stepped on campus in Vanderbilt? And that was actually like a uh, sexy Pete became a thing in the student section. You know what I mean? I would feel like I had well, made we need- it professionally at that point. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, I thought we could make sexy Pete a thing if you want. I think I we should. That. Well, <laughs> what, what, what would sexy Pete say about the last two weeks of the football season or maybe the last well, week? Here's what, here's what sexy Pete would say about this. Okay. Uh, it's been a whirlwind, most of it bad, but you know, it seems like, and, and look, it's uh, what, what's the old saying, Chris, that it's always darkest before the dawn. Well, it's been a rough couple of weeks for us, clearly. And there's potentially a lot more rough times coming, but man, I mean, just some things kind of happen this week that at least make it, you you know, see, sending the clouds out. I look, I mean, I'm not, I'm not stupid, <laughs> but you know, for a, for a base that's had nothing but for the past little, uh, for the past year, really. Um, I was happy about some of the things that transpired this week. I'm going to play a little guessing game. I get metrics on <laughs> how many people read the articles that I write. Uh, we had one, uh, the McBride kid who is at Kansas and is now yeah. committed to play at Vanderbilt after not playing a second at Kansas. In fact, not after suiting up. He he left in September. We did one the same day I did the Mason piece, which if everybody's not read it, I think that made a lot of rounds on Twitter, but some people may not have seen it. It is a perspective piece about Vanderbilt historically, about how much rope coaches get at Power 5 since World War II, uh, and it had a lot of details It took me – a good three days to research. Um, and, and, and I think it's interesting. I think everybody that read it told me they found it interesting. I got a thing back the next day giving me numbers. What do you think was more read, that or the McBride story? I would think that the numbers would be read a lot more. Uh, for me, the McBride thing at Hosel more appeal because I'm needing something to, to get me out of the muck. Uh, so for myself this week, that McBride would be more appealing for me, but I'm going to say that it was your article by a long way. You are correct. Would you like to guess at the multiple? Uh, like it's how many times more? Yes. Okay, uh, let's see. I promise I'm not looking. Uh, I'm going to say to the tune of six times as many readers. Try 21. 21 times the readers? Well, I know it's not a case of 21 versus one, so uh, you you got to like where you're going with that. Yeah, and to to be fair, I would have to go back and look at what time David Sisk published that article. It might have even been before I did, but in, in any case, that was really telling. And I'll tell you another thing. I think that story in its first day got read about eight times more than anything I put out in football season. Well, you know, 
get back to the psychology of things. Yeah, I think people just are drawn to the uh, to a to a train wreck. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean they just are. They they are. You know, it is what it is. And close, there's also the folks that know that you put a lot of time and effort into that, and they. And I, I I saw the preview of it coming up, and you sold it well. You sold yourself well, so I, I thought you did real well there. And it's I, I I've read some of it. Uh, as you know, it's state championship week, so it's been real busy for me. But I've read some of it. Uh, I read, if I remember correctly, I think you, uh, I think one of the deals was that if if Coach Mason were to have a losing year this year, if they were the bombed up in 2020, he would be the what is it? The losingest coach in history in regards to uh, amount of seasons before having a, a winning season to start their head coaching career. Is that right? He would be the seventh coach. I'm sorry, the second coach in FBS school history. In FBS, excuse me. Let, let me start over. Okay, among schools that are currently among the power five which that is 65 schools since world war ii he would be only the second coach in that group to have seven straight losing seasons the other guy was a guy at kansas state Uh, i think his name was jim weaver in the 50s and the 60s he went on to become the head coach at Michigan, excuse me, the athletic director at Georgia Tech and Michigan State. And I don't believe he ever coached another game again. I wonder if he ever fired a, a head football coach. You could look that up. You know, because I said, you're firing me? <laughs> yeah, good point. And at the end of the day, right. Man, you know what? You know what? Don't even worry about it. You know, wrong line of work. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's it's not a, it's not it's certainly not a record that you want to hold by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, there's there's a lot of places we could go with this. Um, trying to articulate some thoughts I've had today. Yeah, there's a lot of people, and you see this on our message board, and I think our board is great. Does it get out of hand at times? Of course it does. I I get to see, I now have a a thing, I I have started to look at all the other, or a lot of the other message boards across the network. I will tell you ours is pretty tame compared to most. It's also smaller compared to most, but and maybe that's part of it. I like to think that our posters are a little bit more thoughtful, and I think for the most part they are, but... People have a right to be upset. Um, you know, there's there's just kind of this sentiment that sometimes that people need to settle down or keep things in perspective. I'm like, what, what are they supposed to do in this case? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't roll with that sentiment because I mean, you know, the 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 opposite would be to. Because they're going to get to the point where they're sliding mirrors under our nose to make sure we're still breathing. You know, come on. No, I mean, I, I, I get that. That sentiment's there and it should be. You know, this, I agree. I, I think this fan base has a lot to, to be vocal about. And whatever the percentage of people it is compared to other fan bases, I don't really care about that. I, I, you know, that doesn't mean anything to me. This is about what me and the people that are there feel and what they think how small a fan base we are how big we are whatever it is, I, I, don't, I don't care about that right now you know I, I want taken care of what needs to be taken care of in house you know what they do in Tuscaloosa is what they do in Tuscaloosa I can't concern myself with that right now I just need this university to focus on us you know and us and us them and and and, and find a middle ground here somewhere and like I said some good things have happened this week and I you know I, maybe it's the start of that's where we're headed. You know, I mean, it may be an uphill process. It may take a little while, but I, I think with the, the hiring of the new chancellor and talking with you and you talking with some of your contacts and some other people that reached out to it, it sounds like a very positive step in the right, in, in the, in the, a step in the right direction for Vanderbilt when it comes to athletics. 
I know where I was going to go. And, and excuse me, because I, I, we're doing this at nine o'clock at night. I've had a long day, not like a bad day, but just, you know, running kids to school and practice and that kind of thing. This is what I meant to articulate earlier. Okay, I remember four, five, six years ago, I started to get very concerned uh, about athletics in terms of the effort level that David Williams was putting out in terms of the song and dance that the school was doing with not answering questions, those kind of things. And I was kind of out there on an island. And for a while, I had a lot of people tell me, oh, you're exaggerating, or you're crazy, or that's that's what you believe, but that's not what Vanderbilt believes. And this went on for years, and you know, you were there for it. There were fights on message boards, and people got upset at me and all sorts of things. And then the truth comes out in August of 2018, and, and now we all know what that was. And, and by the way, this is, this is not to, to pat myself on the back. That's not what I'm trying to do here, but there's, there's a point I'm coming to. And then it came out, and the tone around that fan base completely changed. Would you not agree? I'd say that's right. And now they don't trust anything or anybody over there. And, and Vanderbilt's earned it. Vanderbilt cannot look at people and get mad at the fans or tell them they've overreacted or anything. They shoveled this bull at people for decades and dodged questions and all those things. So Vanderbilt has every right to feel that way. And by the way, I think that's – I think that's something Malcolm Turner knows. Um, maybe, maybe more than a lot of administrators who've been there for decades, but I digress. Um, now the funny thing is, I feel like other than the fact that it looks like they're stuck with the same coaching staff or the same head coach for another year, it, which, by the way, I would not 100% rule out the change. I'm not making a prediction. I'm just saying. And I, I wouldn't encourage fans to get their hopes up about that, by the way, just to be clear. But. Wow. Well, but, but I, 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 and, and I understand that when you say, I'm not saying it will, but, you know, I mean, it's. And I hear you. But that, but, but you understand that that's going to lead the mind to wonder just a little bit. Yeah, I know, and and here's here's I think how that question will be answered. Once they start hiring assistant replacements, presuming that's what they do, then then you can take that off the table because you're not going to hire and fire assistants uh, for this head coach and then make a change on another one weeks or months down the road uh, unless he throws everybody a curveball and, and leaves on his own. Again, no no, no predictions. No no predictions. I'm just trying to cover all my bases here, right? Yep. Um, now I feel like what I see and hear is really optimistic. Uh, like to the point where I don't know that they've raised a, a nine-figure sum for athletics is I'm doing this tonight, but I wouldn't be surprised if they had. For the things that are that are coming, which we still don't know what those are, I feel like I feel strongly like Malcolm Turner is is the guy. And 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 here's a litmus test. I think if a year from now Malcolm Turner is still the AD, I think that's probably a really good sign. I think if a year from now Malcolm Turner is not the AD, that is probably a really bad sign. And we, we tend to paint things in terms of black and white. There are always shades of gray, but I think that'll end up being pretty close to the truth. And I like him. Um, n- not Care to just make personally. A prediction on that then? Well, no, I mean, I just think it means that I think he's aiming really, really high. Uh, everybody I hear, I mean, not everybody, but what I hear about him is overwhelmingly favorable in the whispers and the things people say to me privately, the people that know him, yeah. the people that have met with him. I mean, look, I... I thought Bryce Drew was a great hire for basketball, so I can be wrong. But I really feel like Malcolm is 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 going to do a good job if they will work with him. And, I, you you yeah. already know it. I agree with you on that. I, I, we're coming from the same place. I've met Malcolm. Uh, he's, I, I, I believe, and you and I have had enough of these conversations on and off this podcast to, uh, you know, that I feel like 
have a pretty decent grasp of, 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 of what, I, what he's trying to do and what he's all about. And I like what I see. So I, I, I mean, I, if there was a, if I had any criticism and, and made it clear, and I would say that to him, he was standing in front of me, uh, was, it just seemed like to, because look, you know, we may not have six national championships, but we, we keep up with our team just like any other fan base does with the same type of, uh, you know, fervency and, 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 and passion, you know, and we, we know what's real, right, Chris, well, you're not going to fool us when it comes to, to this university and it's, and it's, and it's sports programs and football teams, the people that are on the board that have been, we know what it is. You're not going to fool this fan base. And, I just, I mean, I look at Malcolm, man, and I just, I, he looks like an ideal man uh, that is, is, is going to aggressively try to implement his ideas. Uh, the question will just simply be, you know, is Vanderbilt willing to play some ball with him, have a little flexibility when it comes to that? That's why I think that this chancellor situation is a, a very good opportunity. If, if you happen to be right about that, you got my dogs all hyped up. Man. Everybody calm down. Breathe deep, Mr. Bean. Ooh, there's a name for the article. Breathe deep, Mr. Bean. There you go. But, I mean, I don't know, man. I just, I just, I just think that – if there was one criticism that I would have, it just been, I, I don't know how much, and maybe he did. I don't know. I, I don't know how much he truly believed all the things that he had said when he initially was talking about uh, having Derek, you know, Derek Mason's back and this and all this other stuff. And, you know, it just, cause the, the, the first reaction that I saw I had, and it's a lot of other people on the board were like, do you really believe this? Cause if you do, there might be a bigger problem. And I think that was people's initial reaction. But, I mean, I also think that we may not have really had all the facts in regards to all that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and I want to touch on an element of that later, but I'll tell you one thing that occurred to me too. You know, the, the story on why Malcolm Turner moved on from Bryce Drew was along the lines of this. He went to one practice. He was appalled at what he saw. That's all he needed to see. And Bryce's plan, I've heard it's been presented. I've heard it's not been been presented. I tend to tend to lean towards the latter. I, I think if you, in other words, if you go to practice and you see a coach that you think's incompetent, um, what what's he going to be able to do in terms of bringing a plan that you're going to going to believe? And and I think this this is why I've always said I just don't take what is said at face value. I would not bet my life on it, but if you had to make me take a choice, I would say I would strongly feel that I think that there were things that, whether it was the contract or whatever, or the chancellor that, that tied his hands. I'm thinking like, okay, what what by that same litmus test – about the way the program was run this year, about any plan to turn things around, what would make you think that Derek has put forth coherent reasons to make him think that he can turn this around? And I can't come up with anything. Right. So that that's where I stand still. But that's another thing we had not talked yeah. about. Uh, the, the other thing is I'm hearing really positive stuff on the chancellor. That there's a lot of buy-in, that the AD is pleased with the hire, those sorts of things. And I think that he has spent an inordinate amount of time with athletics already. Which, you know, Zeppos never did. I mean, I, I did have a coach tell me that I think he had them over to his place for a cookout or something. He it's not like Zeppos never interacted with athletics. But I don't think he was ever over at McGugan and involved, and certainly he just disappeared the last few years. So I don't well, think I don't. He was busy, Chris. He was oh, busy yeah. looking for a rocket ship. I'll, I'll give him a, uh, a, a reprieve on that one. Oh yeah, he, on, I mean, he, yeah, that, that's true. Because he, I mean, he was he was so busy um, that his his personal assistant said he could not come on my radio show for ten minutes the entire fall back when I was on radio. So yes, he was a very busy man. Um, very busy, man. Very busy. 
We get more cynical. <laughs> we do this late at night, don't we? You make me. I'm a. I'm a sunny. I have a sunny disposition. Yes, you do. No, but I, I really do think. I don't think that. I mean, what are the chances that the chancellor at Vanderbilt spends a lot of time with athletics right when he's being hired? If if that's not important, if, if you know they are tweeting yeah. things out, it just everything that that I hear privately lines up with this is going to be a priority. So oh, man, I, the, I like that song to to, you're to saying, sum man. it up, I think that they are headed for a much better place, but the problem is how many people are still going to hang with them through this football season, and and that's the thing that we've talked about for a while now. Well. So. But here's the thing, Chris. Let me say this. Look, now, look, there are people that I'm sure they've officially lost. I mean, I don't think that's just lip service on the part of a lot of people. No, it's not. You know, and you can't and you can't blame them either. That in the past. Yeah, I would have said that in the past, but I don't think that's the case right now. I, th- I think they legitimately and a fan base who really didn't have the fans to lose, lost some. And, and they'll never get them those particular people back. And that sucks. Uh, but that is, I, I can't undo that. So, you know, that's, that, that's where we are with that. But I think, I, I think if what you're talking about is right, if, if some of the things that hit, if we as a fan base can see that, can clear, because again, this is not a fan base of stupid people, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, and you're not going to pull one over on us uh, because the truth is you never really tried in the first place. You know, so it's not like you got this and then the rug came out from under you. I mean, they made it clear to us how they felt about us for a while. But now this it just seems like potentially some things are lining up. And I think you're right. I I, I think the Malcolm Turner hire is going to, I believe, bear fruit uh, eventually. And, and same with the brand new chance. Chris, is it is is or call the gentleman's name? I think that's it. Yeah, that's that's how I have been yeah. pronouncing it. Yeah, it's something like that. But uh, you know, that's why I said when I prefaced by the start of this podcast. Podcast, if you remember, I said you know, in, in a month of bleh, there's been some things that you know make you feel a bit better about it. And these first two things we're touching on are are. Some of those are not the only ones, by the way. There's a couple of other good things uh, that are going on right now, but uh, those are two of the most important pieces. But that fan base is not taking any consolation in any of that right now. They just don't believe. No, but yeah, I know. But 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 look, if 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 they see, if they can tangibly see that this is legit, this is going to happen. I know you're frustrated. I know it's been a long time, but I'm here to tell you right now. This is the plan, you know, I have every freaking detail, uh, but something that tangible that I can put eyes to and that I can go beyond just imagining, uh, you know, then I think that this fan base would say, okay, the situation is what it is right now, but it is not going to stay this way. And something big is coming around the corner. Then I think that's salvageable. I mean, I, I, I won't like next season, you know, when it plays out that way. But it is what it is. If I got something, if I can see a big payoff on the back end, you know, I'll do that. You know, it's just like some of these players and, and with contracts and they see, you know, they look at the big picture and it's backloaded big time. And at the end of the day, you're going to be real happy about it. I kind of feel that way. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Let's go to the mailbag, which is sponsored Mail by Vanderbilt, bag. Vanderbilt Fan and independent insurance agent Josh Minton of Brentwood. If you need home, auto, motorcycle, renters, landlord, life, or commercial insurance, Josh is your guy. Call him at 615-933-1979. Email him at josh at hqinsurance.com. Follow him on Facebook at J.D. Minton HQ. He is my insurance agent. Try him, and you will be pleased. Ann Arbordor says, uh, wait, you are- Chris, before you ask the question, before you ask the question, Chris, I just had the idea of the century. Okay. Are you ready for this? Let's let's hear. For the mailbag from from now on, I want you to record this this week. I want you to go hire an, a, a little a, a little maybe a female ensemble of about three or four. Here's what I want you to do. 
All right. This just came to me. I want you to have them record this into the studio. Let's all go to the mailbag. Let's all go to the mailbag. Let's all go to the mailbag to talk about the black and gold. What do you think? I don't and then we play that before we do the mailbag every week. I don't think I have an ensemble. All right. That's all I get. I mean, you consider making this happen? If you have an oh, ensemble can that can put this week. together, then be my guest. Maybe I could just sing it. I could sing this every week when it's time to go to the mailbag. You could. You should come up Would with you? the mailbag jingle that you sing. I, I just did. I literally just sang it. That's, this is true. <laughs> my goodness. Uh, man, I'm ready for it. Who did you say was up first? Ann Arbordor? Ann Arbordor, who is eagerly awaiting this podcast, by the way. He will be very happy when oh. this is out. Uh, you Lovely. were both very critical of Malcolm Turner's decision to keep Derek Mason for another year. What would both of you have done differently? Mm. Put very simply, not. <laughs> but, you know, like I said, we are where we are. So I'm, I'm I don't know how what else to do because I'm not going to cut. I, I just can't just cut bait. I just can't. Uh, because I think there is something around the corner. I, and, I, and I really believe that. What would I have done differently? I would probably have made a different decision. You know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, if I went big picture and I would probably make a, a different decision because of something that I said, there's nothing against Coach Mason, but it's kind of like the question that I asked. Well, you remember, Chris, on a week or two ago on a, one of the podcasts when I said, if you're not going to fire him this year, then why would you fire him next year? It wouldn't make any sense. Right. You know, so, you know, I mean, and if you're not going to, then that means you're probably not going to the year after that. And that, even with, even with some of the good things, be such a, I think that, a big fat being in the middle. So boom, big explosion right there because one thing is so good. And then this other thing right here is such a massive negative that you can't go any farther in the right direction. And I, I don't know how that would turn out. I have an issue with the question because I have never termed it Malcolm Turner's decision to keep Derek Mason. I think that should be better term Vanderbilt's decision to keep Derek Mason, and, and either way you slice it, let's say that, for example, let's say that there was a $20 million cost to part with that coaching staff. I don't know that that's true. Nobody knows the number. I've heard as low as nine. Fifteen seems to be around where people settle. At, at the high point, some people have speculated 20. But whatever the number is, let's say that it was, was cost prohibitive or whatever, or whatever number of reasons that you felt that you couldn't get rid of. And by the way, uh, maybe it is a valid reason to say that he had put feelers out in the coaching world, which I believe he had, to see what the market would bear. And maybe at face value, he is right, that you were better off paying the tax on Derek Mason for another year or whatever that may be till you can get the right coach. I'm not going to say that that is 100% the wrong move because I don't have all the facts in that. But the decision was a bad one. Whether it was is framed as, as keeping him now or giving him that ridiculous guarantee that David Williams gave him, or whatever the case may be, it's it's a bad situation. So we can try to slice it any way we want. It, it's it's not good. The fans don't believe we ran a poll on Twitter. I think eighty percent of the people were against it. That may have included. Fans of other teams <laughs> voting for it just because. We ran one on our site that was private. It was closer to 90% or 95%. So, look, you can you can phrase this whatever you want, but it's not a good decision for Vanderbilt, however they arrived at it. Maybe they had to. I get that. But having him back for year seven, again, if you can, su if you can show me a good purpose that it serves, uh, then I'm listening, but I can't find one. Yeah, I, I think to sum it up and just the at the end of the day, the answer would be is um, just because you had to doesn't make it okay. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. 
T.C. Yeah. Stevens has, has talked me into Vanderbilt football in 2020. Will you please go first on that one? <laughs> I was going to ask the same of you. Man, always make me go first. All right, I'll go. I'll go first. Uh, well, this won't be easy, you know. I, I, I'm a, I'm a loquacious rascal, and I do this for a living, and I don't know what to say, Chris. <laughs> but, but we'll, 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 we'll give it a shot. I, I think one of the selling points is what we've been talking about in the first thirty minutes of this podcast, uh, in or in the at least the last thirty minutes of this podcast, and some of the, some of the perspective things and chancellorship and, uh, and, 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 and how we feel for the most part about Mount Turner and, and the potential there and the money that may be around the corner. Those are some bright spots. I think that, uh, I think that Robert Seals, uh, excuse me, that's Mr. Seals. Uh, I think that Ken Seals is going to be a Vanderbilt Commodore. As a matter of fact, he's on campus as we speak right now on his official visit and looks like it's going pretty freaking well. Um, I think that he is a bright spot and there's been some debate about what he is or isn't as a quarterback, but uh, uh, that kid's a winner, you know, and I, and I think, I think he's going to be really good. I real, I really do. Um, there's a lot returning. Uh, what is it, Chris? 18 starters, I think it is. Of, of, I, I think it's something like that. 18 starters, I believe, and pretty much the entire defense. Um, and in some cases, that that'll be okay. You know, certainly plenty of experience right there. Uh, we still have some really good underclassmen, young uh, skill position players uh, that have have a chance to still be pretty good. Uh, I really hope that. CJ Bowler could get it going next year. I think Cam Johnson's only going to get better. You know, we've got some, uh, I think that Keon Brooks flashed a little bit, uh, for a freshman, you know, and it's just, you know, it's look, I'm not going to try to sit here and pretend that this is going to be a good football team next year, but there are some bright, bright but it's the best I can do. Next question from DFW Mark. Whoa, 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 whoa. They asked us to sell them, not just me. Was, uh, come on, I've done this before. Come on now. I was hoping I could get away with that. Um, you cannot. Look, the defense played better at the end of the year. The defense is going to return the entire starting unit, uh, minus Caleb Peart. Uh, whether he was a starter or not, I don't know what you consider him, but sometimes he, well, for really the second half of the year, I think he was off the field more than he was on it. They have a lot of backups coming back, but I mean, man, they still gave up 437 yards a game and 391 points on the season, 381. I mean, that's 30 something a game. I mean, even if you're a lot better, you're still just okay at best. I'm not saying they can't take a quantum leap up. I mean, in fact, let me go back and look at this. Okay. Oh my God, sign me up. Sign um, me up, man. Where do I get tickets? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sexy Pete. Um, <laughs> uh, this isn't as good as I thought either. I, I was thinking that they made a big leap from year one to year two um, with defense. They gave up 399 his first year. They gave up 351. Okay, that's yardage. Okay. So that's that's better. Points they went from 399 to 252. Uh so that they they did make a significant step up in defense from from 2014, which was his first year to 2015 and that was also the year that he stepped or that he fired his defensive coordinator and took the defense over again and they also had Zach Cunningham and Adam Butler who as you may be aware are not around anymore so I don't know maybe maybe if he becomes his own defensive coordinator again they get a lot better because it's happened once uh, but of course, that year they scored. What was it? 
Uh, trying to look at how many points they scored that season. Oh boy, yeah, they went from two hundred six to one eighty two. It was ugly. Uh, so they just didn't have much on offense, which, you know. There you go. That's the best I can do. The best. What, we, what is it that you were doing? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer the question without being ridiculous. Um, I think the question was sell me on 2020. Sexy Pete, you gave it your best shot. <laughs> I tried, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just, <laughs> I, I don't mean to pile on, but I don't know how you look at this any other way. I mean, yeah, they, they could hey, be man. a lot better on defense, but they've never been good on offense. By the way, how, how did Andy Ludwig do this year? Um, I just don't, the they, way, they, they, they need to be a like lot better on both ball. sides of the ball. And it's hard to make a case that they can be. Yeah, that's not going to. We know. We know that. I mean, you know, just, I'm just trying to complete the exercise. The question, dude, asked. But yeah, I mean, I don't. I'm not gonna be a good football team. I'm still gonna watch to see how things go. And again, there's some. I mean, the, the biggest question of them all, personnel-wise, on the field is who's going to be the quarterback of this team. You know, what's the situation? You know, is it going? Is, is, and still is going to be the starting quarterback for Vanderbilt next year. I don't know. I think so. Out of necessity, but I don't know that. I mean, apparently it looks like, as, of course, you, you've been uh, insinuating basically on the board that it looks like that Deuce Wallace, in fact, will be back next season. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I strongly believe that's going to be the case. Okay. Well, that's that certainly helps. I mean, it, it just does. You know, so we'll, we'll see how that turns out. But, I mean, that's got to be the – Biggest question personnel on this team by far, I would think. DFW Mark asks, do you think that Malcolm Turner will put Derek Mason on the performance program with certain criteria he will have to meet in order to keep his job in 2021? If so, what would those criteria be? What resources would he provide to Mason in order to have him meet the performance goals? I would hope that he already is, you know, to be honest with you, but I don't know if that's the case. But in in regards to what could Malcolm do to help him, I don't know how much he can really do at all to help in regards for 2020. Would you say that's probably fair no matter what he does? Well, the question I have, and I think I have talked about this on the site and maybe on the podcast, is if part of the whole thing with not firing him this year is not to throw um, good money after bad in that they can't hire another new coach, right? Does that not principle, does that not that same principle not go to assistance? In other words, um, you either know you're going to keep him a couple of years regardless of how poor he is, in which case maybe you do throw some resources at him. But if next year is up for debate, how in are you is is Vanderbilt towards attracting coaches? Because if you're going to attract a good coordinator, you're going to have to give him a multi-year guarantee and a lot of money. So then maybe what you're paying coordinators a top assistance buyouts for, for after 2020. If you make the change then, um <laughs> If you don't make the change and you're in on Mason for the long term, then you know how people are going to feel about that. I, I you know, it's back to what Ann Arbor asked of us about being critical about the decision. Again, it's it's not about Malcolm Turner; it's about the whole situation, and it's that they are boxed right. in. It, it does not matter what turn you take, based on the facts, based on the history. It does not matter what turn you take. You cannot find a reasonable explanation that this ends well or that serves the program well beyond other than, oh, well, once we get the facilities out there, we can do better at attracting the next coach. And that's not me being pessimistic. That's just me being real based on the facts, which we now have a six-year track record. 
No, I think I'm going to hold that against you. No, uh, oh, and I'm, I'm not have. implying that people are. I'm just... I've been looking at this for months, and I've said this before. It's like the Bryce Drew podcast we did at the end of the year. That I don't know that I did these with you, but I did them with other people. And I just said, I, every way that I turn, I can't find a way for Vanderbilt to get a win in this. Because it, it looked like they would not be very good for this coming season, um, especially the way Bryce had coached them recruiting had not gone particularly well and then it's like okay you're going to have a rough season in 2019 2020 Neesmith may be gone the next year you've not recruited as well in those classes you didn't do well with some of the good recruits you had again we, we are we're boxed in at every turn and it's it's the same thing here yeah who you know by the way uh one of the other Things and we're getting right back back to the mailbag. But one of the things that I was really, at least halfway excited about is, man, I just I continue to like watching this basketball team, Chris. You know, I yeah. mean, I, I know they're limited. I get that. I, I know that a major SEC schedule is on the way. You know, I get it. I understand it. I know we're all keenly aware of that. But they're all, they're fun to watch, man. They I mean, you know, they they, they put it out there, man. And they and, and you know, hey, they can shoot. Man, this team has the ability to hit from the outside, clearly. You know, and I mean, like I said in a couple of weeks ago in a podcast before the season started, there were people asking if the streak would end this year. I'll tell you what, I, I've not had a lot of real criticisms of Malcolm Turner, but I have just kind of thought of one just now. He needs to get Sherry Stackhouse out there more on the radio, on whatever. Because Jerry, I'm telling you, Jerry is an interesting dude to be around. He is he is yeah. wickedly funny out of the blue. Um, you never know when it's coming. He gives great answers. He's easy to deal with. Their team, like you said, is fun. I look at the landscape of SEC basketball this year. You saw Missouri lose a game as a 26-point favorite to Charleston Southern. Right now, they are not the worst team in the Sagarins, in the SEC, or excuse me, in Ken Palm, uh, which I did not think would be the case. Texas A&M is actually worse than them. And A&M lost a game to Fairfield, which I think was 1-6 coming in. The stat. Yeah, I mean, all of a sudden, there is a path. I think that staying out of the Wednesday game – in the SEC tournament might might be a little much to bite off, but I don't know that it's impossible. I just if anything other than not being last place or maybe 13th, I think is a big improvement. And I think that's something they can do now. And like you said, they are they are interesting to watch. He is an entertaining coach to follow. They have a little something to promote. And I think they need to get him out there more because I think he is a guy that people can buy into. He he is not hey. he's not charismatic, but the more that you're around him and the more that you see him talk, I think the more impressive he gets. Yeah, you know, uh, I I like that. I think that's a really good idea. Malcolm, listen, to Chris, that's a good idea. Uh, I want to just say real quick, man. I think that. Uh, you know, I was trying to think while you were talking about Coach Stackhouse, if I could think of anybody that he reminded me of personality-wise, and 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 maybe there is, but it's not coming to my mind. I don't. I, I've never really seen anybody like him. I like it. I wouldn't even know how to classify it. I would if you were asking me to describe it to somebody. His personality, I don't know that I could adequately do it. Uh, he's a unique dude. I dig him. Yeah, I do too. I'm the same way. I can't think of anybody that he remotely reminds me of. I mean, maybe Brad Stevens with the random sense of humor, but I think he is endearing and I think he's sincere. And I think those are qualities that cause people to like coaches along with looking like you know what the heck you were doing and answering questions honestly and fielding a 
well, we can't say he's fielded a good team yet. Uh, maybe he will, given a couple of years. But he's fielding an entertaining team right now and an interesting team. And, again, I have said this, I think, at other points. I did not expect them to be that this year. Whatever I thought about this season, I thought it was going to be grinded out. I did not expect that they would actually be pretty fun to watch, which I think they are. You know, and, and the more that he gets going, you know, and the more I think he's going to get even more comfortable because that's the thing. Does he look like he's not comfortable? Even though this is his first time as a head coach, like the situation is overwhelming to him. I mean, I, I get he's been a head coach before, but the spotlight's never really been on him. I mean, I, 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 let me do this. Hey, everybody listening on the podcast now, off the top of your head, name four G League teams. Yeah, I'm, you know I'm there I mean? with you. Yeah, you know, and, and now, you know, he, he's out there. His name's out there. And and if he continues to win some more basketball games, then people are going to start taking a, a look at this thing a little bit more. And I think, man, uh, this is a guy who already looks like he's completely comfortable in his skin as a head coach at this level. You know, again, now the battles, the big conference battles haven't happened yet. But, I, I mean, I don't expect for him to change a whole heck of a lot based, you know, based on what we've seen so far. I think the approach is probably going to be the same. Mr. Vandy says, do you think they can hang on to Kaufman and Butler? Good grief, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I, do I think the chances are good that maybe they lose one? Yeah, sure. I mean... When when they start looking around, especially like with, with with Jordan Butler, I mean, I think he's in Evanston as we speak. I do believe, um, and you know, it's. I mean, I know the record sucked this year, but so did ours. Uh, but I mean, they've already got a lot. I mean, what what what, what are they spending half a billion dollars or something like that, Chris? Yeah, something uh, like that. on all kinds of. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever been to Evanston, but I, I, I was there the last time Vanderbilt played at that game. And oh man, uh, let me tell you something. If I hadn't grown up a Vanderbilt fan, and and I was was uh, you know little bar, promise that's where I would have went. And that was before any of the improvements. Uh, but but some of the stuff that they they had on the drawing board and that they're implementing now is is pretty freaking impressive and guys like jordan butler don't grow on trees for vanderbilt i mean not only is he a big physical beast i mean you're talking about one of the captains of, of the uh on the uh, img team you know he's had an impact right away he had a great season this year i i we don't get those and then you know what's crazy is i mean he clearly believes in his coaching staff and his relationship with uh i think javon uh is 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 real integral in all of that he hasn't even been to campus you know so he's clearly tied to the staff you know because he's not walked on this camp well yeah you know, there certainly can't be that attachment to it. So, yeah, I think that if he hasn't been to Vanderbilt campus and he goes and sees what they're doing in Evanston, yeah, he could absolutely flip. With Donovan Kaufman, I told you for a while now, Donovan Kaufman is clearly one of the best players in the state of Louisiana, which is no small statement. And if he were two inches taller, uh, this would be much hard, even harder to hold on to him. Could he flip? Sure. Uh Either one of losing either one of those guys would be pretty crappy. To lose both of them would kick the teeth out of what has been a pretty, honestly, a pretty solid class. All things considered, it's been a pretty solid class, and I know there hasn't been a lot additions to it because it almost got filled before the season even started. Vandy Nash says, um. What happens if Grant Williams doesn't get that flop freight flagrant call? Well, I mean, are we, are, is the inference that, cause it, I mean, I, I get it's one, a, a huge play. I get that, but I mean, this team didn't win a single game. This team started off, what was it, Chris? Nine and three. Nine or four, something like that. They never won again. 
if this team was so fragile that that one thing helped, helped that be the case, then we didn't really have anything in the first place. That's the only way I know how to answer that. What do you say? I think that if that goes their way, they probably win the game. They were fragile. They get a little bit more confidence at that point. I don't think the bar was very high for him to keep his job. I mean, that's that's what I think. Malcolm may have seen what he saw and decided he needed to make a change, but if they win three, four games in the SEC, then everybody's saying, well, Garland was hurt. They planned around him. All the things that we've been through a million times. And they would be correct. What? And And... Hear me out on this, okay? All right. I know that Vanderbilt fans don't ever like to lose in, to Tennessee in anything. I think that might have been a blessing in disguise. Because, and, and you know how much I thought Bryce was a good hire and how much I liked him, all those things. We've, we've been I through do. that. I do. I just think he was so deficient as a head coach in terms of how he led in those things that they're just, it wasn't going to happen. I mean, you, you go back and look at the year before they had some talent on that team. He thrown in the towel because he was looking for his all American kids and trying to run those kids off and that sort of thing. Um, I think that ended up doing them a favor, man, because I think the bar was, was probably so low they were going to be saddled with the coach that I don't think was going to get the job done for another year or two. And again, you know my theory, we said this a couple of weeks ago, when you know a guy is not the right guy for the job, you have to do everything in your power to move on. Uh, now, I will say this, uh, okay. the difference the difference between him and the Mason situation is Bryce had an outstanding record at Valparaiso. I mean, he was like, what, 100 games that's over 500 in five what? years? That's that's the that's part the that I can't right reconcile. There. That that is the part that I have trouble reconciling, and that part was a big foundation of my opinion because I, I think if you if you win a lot of games, man, that says something. Um, and he won a lot of games there. They went to what the NIT final, and that's not it. That's not a just an awful league. Which makes which begs the question. I was thinking about that earlier during this podcast. I mean, that's the whole question behind it. Because look, it's like I was talking about just a second ago. Look, that's why the Williams thing. You say what you want, but come on. Look, you you know how poorly coached that basketball team was. You know how poorly coached they were. You know, so even if we want to say that the players' psyche were fragile because of that flop, all this other stuff. Yeah, that's fine. But look how poorly coached they were, Chris. Are you telling me all that hinged, the way they were coached, the entire thing hinged on that? Come on, no chance. And if it was, that was an even bigger problem. Yeah, two things. I think when you have to ask some questions, the fact that you're even asking them tells you the answer already. Uh, and I thought of this the other day, too. Remember when the question about this football season was, oh, can they make it through Georgia, LSU, and a Purdue team team that we thought would have Rondell Moore, of course they did for that game, and, and be better than it was. Can they make it through that gauntlet without them getting their confidence killed like happened uh, in 2017 with Alabama, Georgia, Florida? <laughs> Talk about that not being part of the narrative at all. I mean, it's funny. It's like that what killed them was Ole Miss UNLV. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll ride with that. And, I, yeah, I can remember we're sitting there trying to figure out how they can navigate a, at least a one and two record out of the three. Uh, let's go short on that one. Let's see, Sr. Kane. Well, I say what, Chris? Yeah, Utah is trying to make Utah is trying to come back in this game. And I don't know if you're watching this Pac-12 championship, but they are trying to make a comeback. I will now turn it on. I 
have YouTube TV and it, I was afraid of it eating at the bandwidth um, of the podcast. And I turned it You're off. You're speaking a foreign language. I don't even know what that means. I mean, I, I know what it means, but I, 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 I don't even, I don't get any of it. Oh yeah. I see what you mean now. Um, anyway, it affects the quality to put it in your terms. Okay. Oh, thank. Now that I get <laughs> that was that was so condescending, and I didn't mean to be. Um, S. R. Kane says <laughs> <laughs> the Stackhouse, <laughs> the Stackhouse basketball team has been the Vanderbilt team I have felt a pers- the most personal connection with since the James Franklin football teams. Do you think Derek Mason should take a note out of the Jerry Stackhouse book and try to bring more insight into the fans about his team to hopefully provoke, promote some more fan connection? And he asks us to explain. Uh, yeah, I, I, sure. I, I think that'd be a wonderful idea. But I would also point out that, you know, I mean, he's already been surrounded by Tim Corbin for six years. You know? You know what I mean? I mean, so, I mean, if this, as far as approaches go, I mean, just being around Tim Corbin, uh, having that dude rub off on, I don't care if it is a different sport. I mean, the approach to that job, to your job as, 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 a, as a coach of a major program like that, you know, he's, he's already had that type of stuff right in front of him anyway. Well, I don't think he needs to say anything to anybody at this point um, because that just gets him in more trouble. Look, until he learns to be more organized and on top of things and how to think through things in that manner, which after six years, it's not going to happen suddenly. I mean, if they're going to keep him, find some kind of expert in efficiency and top-down thinking uh, and, and hope it works a miracle because none of the other stuff matters. If you don't know how to lead, and be organized and stay on top of things, if after six years he still doesn't understand how to do clock management and those sorts of these are just things that there aren't fixes for. I mean, I look at Tim Corbin. If, if you want to know when you don't see something and what's wrong, look at a guy like Tim who aces just about all the tests and hold a guy up to that mirror, and then you see what the answers are about what's missing. Sure. And he is, he is the polar opposite of Tim Corbin. I don't mean to turn this into a Bash Mason podcast, but if, if people are going to ask the questions, I'm just going to answer them honestly. None of that other stuff matters because he doesn't understand any of the stuff that Tim understands that has made that program successful. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give a whole lot of resistance to Chris on that one, y'all. But, uh, yeah, so to the question that I have, I mean, should he uh, take a take a page from Coach Stack in that regard? Yeah, man, I mean, why not? Yeah, I mean, you don't have to be beholden to a certain way of doing things. You can always take a little bit of something from from uh, from everybody. You know, you, that's, that's part of growing and learning as a coach. Uh, yeah, that's what I like about that's what I was that's why again, that's why I was so impressed with Stag because he just seems to be he doesn't seem like this is his first college, uh, college head coaching job. You know what I'm saying? I mean, because he's comfortable enough with the media. And I guess a lot of that has to do with the fact that he's been you know, he he's he's been at the forefront his whole life. You know, he's certainly trained over the last couple of years, cut his teeth there too, uh, that really given who he is and, and his basketball experience throughout his life and the uh, levels of achievement that he has had, uh, you know, maybe it's just it's prepared and put him in a place to go along with the personality that he already has uh, that says, you know, yeah. Let's put it th- let me put it to you like this. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a question to you. And I think it's completely, I don't say that it's unfair, but it's its pretty, there's very little reason to make this comparison between the two or try to, because the situations, while technically are, are alike, are also very, very different. And that's, that's in terms of recruiting. 
clearly Penny has that advantage, but there are reasons for that, and you realize that. Uh, but what about as a basketball coach so far, Chris Lee? Just as a pure head basketball coach so far, Stack versus Penny. I, honest to God, I've not watched Memphis play. So, hard hard for me to answer that. I mean, from what I hear, the, the returns have been encouraging. I mean, people seem... Yeah. Favorably, uh, people speak favorably of his coaching. I just, I'm, mean, you know, what my life is like at this point. It's, it's being on this beat. It's watching the kids, and then whatever's left over is, um, you know, watching the Titans and keeping up with fantasy football on Sunday. <laughs> I don't, I don't even get to watch. I think I told you, I, I watch less. Well, and that's the other thing. My nephew playing at Wyoming. I watched less college football this year than I think I've ever watched. Like, probably since I was nine or ten. Oh, Chris, I'm sorry, but I just received some fantastic news. Yes? As I as I exhale. Can we share? Vinatieri. Sure, Vinatieri's out this week. <laughs> You know, <laughs> my boys have a, my boys are gonna win. I have a bone to pick with you. Bring it on! I sent you a congratulatory Colts win text before that Titans game because I was like, it "Just it's the Colts. We're screwed. Let's just accept it on the front end." I did not, I did not get anything from you after that game. I bet you were a little steamed, that, how, weren't you? That was like the worst kicking performance that, ever. How did this become about you? <laughs> because this is my podcast. Oh, and you're here we go. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Oh, I'm just happy, man. That just, that's just some of the best news I've heard in a while. I love the dude, but that's four games now, and I, I just can't handle it no more. The team should be 10 and 2, 9 and 3 at the worst. Ugh. I'm just glad the Titans finally got one there. Well, I'm not. I mean, look, I want y'all to, I want you and your fan base to have happiness and, and success, just not more than. Um, by the way, I've got one more question and I'll uh, get that out of the way and we'll end the podcast and maybe we'll sleep tonight, but. I've been meaning to give a shout out. You know, I, my niece plays basketball at Colorado State. I'm going to go see her. They play the Lady Vols on Wednesday. Go Lady Rams. Yeah, we got to see her when we were out in Colorado, and she actually played about three minutes at the end of a blowout. Uh, Colorado State played Incarnate Word. And she's already uh, she scored five points the first game they played. She's an invited walk-on. So anyway, yeah. I'm, I talk about my nephew a lot. Um, I, I have neglected to give my niece a shout out on the podcast too. Not that she listens to these, but, um, there it is. I'm very proud of her too. Well, man, look at her out there shaking them tricks out there. Shoestrings. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> um, let's end with this one. And I think you've answered it. Um, what do you think of Vanderbilt getting the Kansas transfer? He has a Padres question we can talk about next, but let's, Talk about the Vandy Ooh, one. Goody. Uh, what was the quote? Oh, uh, Isaac McBride. What I think about Isaac McBride uh, committing to Vanderbilt. Yeah. Uh, all, all day long, Jack. I mean, you know, there's a ton of potential there. There's no question about it. Uh, a commit is just that, a commit. So until he signs, uh, we'll see. Uh, but this look, this team, well, they play hard. There's no question about that. They still clearly need a lot more depth and a lot more personnel and playmakers. There's no doubt about that. And maybe to play the, the kind of ball that Stackhouse wants to play, you got to have enough of them. And we're not there yet. And that's, that's okay. We knew that going in. Uh, but the ones that are there are putting it up. And that's what I like to see. Uh, so the cat with the skill set of his, uh, uh, or a skill set like his falls in your lap, I, I think you have to be pleased. Sure. 
Knoxville Door says, what do you think of the Padres' moves? And let me make sure I've got all these. Okay, I know that they traded yesterday. They traded Hunter Renfro and Xavier Edwards, who was a former Vanderbilt commitment. Yeah. I think the number one, number 71 prospect on MLB.com. I think he was higher than that earlier. I could be wrong. Uh, they traded those two for um, Tommy Pham. And what else have they done? Uh, well, they traded for him and a, a AAA prospect, uh, Cronin, Croningster or something like that, uh, who's actually, uh, he's doing some p- uh, pitching and fielding duties. Uh, they think that he could be a sneaky, decent uh, utility cat at second base, maybe behind Jerks and Profar, and I'll get to that in just a second. But uh, uh, in regards to this trade, look, you know, I, I hate to lose Xavier Edwards, but you must understand uh, Xavier Edwards is, could play a couple positions. He could he could certainly play infield, shortstop. He play outfield, play center field, if have to, and maybe who knows, maybe even second base. But you have to understand, uh, Vanderbilt is I'm just Vanderbilt. Good lord, uh, the Padres are eat up with prospects, good ones, ones that are panning out. C.J. Abrams, the young man, you know, I remember C.J. Abrams uh, is playing Owen Miller. Uh, I mean, they got some really good looking young prospects at the same position. And he certainly isn't playing shortstop anytime soon in San Diego. That place is that that position is spoken for for the next 10 years, hopefully. Uh, So I hate to lose Xavier. And, you know, with Hunter Renfro, look, Hunter Renfro has a cannon for a right arm. And he can mash. I mean, he hit over 30 home runs last year. Uh, you know, I was watching some MLB network today. They were breaking some of this trade down, and they were making some comparisons of who Hunter Renfro was. And I, th- I thought that made sense. One of the comparisons, you know, who there was, Chris, was Rob Deere. Yeah. I, mean, you know, I get that look. Yeah, it's a really yeah, good I mean, comparison. Some, well, but, but wait a minute. There's um, some, Deer wasn't a center fielder, was he, at any point? No, but neither is Hunter Renfro. No, well, I mean, he was in college, um, but yeah, but no, he's he's a he's a, he's a right fielder in in the pros. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I knew I knew he didn't play center in San. I'm just saying there might be a little more athleticism there than. Um, oh, he look. Let me tell you something. I, I he's got a plus on arm. There, there, there's no doubt about it. But, but he is woeful fully inconsistent at the plate. You know, yes, uh, another point that was brought up is that, you know, there were 34 players in the league this year from the right side of the plate that hit 30-plus home runs. 34. That's a bunch. Yeah, his skills you know, are not scarce anymore. Right. No, no, they are not. And, you know, but, I mean, he has a lot of swinging and missing with Hunter. And I like Hunter. I, I do. But. Let me tell you something. And even though the financials work out for him, and he's got, what, four years of control, Fam has two, Fam's getting eight, Renfro's getting three. Look, that's what you do when you do business with Tampa. You, Whatever you want to think about Tampa, uh, I think they're one of the most underrated franchises in Major League Baseball. They just win, and they don't lose trades for the most part. But I'll say this to you. Uh Tommy Pham is absolutely perfect for San Diego. That back, that outfield, excuse me, has been in, 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 in it's, it's, it's just been a revolving door, and they've been looking forever, so for forever to get some pieces there, and they've got some on the way. There's a couple studs uh, that that are coming up uh, that I think have a chance to really do something special. You know, I think C.J. Abrams is one of those guys, uh, but they and, and Taylor Trammell that they got in that trade uh, coming in. He's the number two prospect in that organization right now. And you look at them, man, and and, and some of the other cats that they've got coming. And in Tommy Pham fits perfectly on this team. I know he's a little bit older, but he mashed last year, and he plays the game with with uh, with a with an edge about him. That's the only way I really know how to phrase that. And you're going to sandwich him in that lineup between Tatis and Machado. So your first three batters are going to be Fernando Tatis, Tommy Pham, and Manny Machado. You know that that's. You know, for a team who has struggled offensively, that's a hell of a one-two-three punch out the gate every night. 
you know, I, I like the trade. I, I really do. Uh, and as far as the other moves, they traded uh, for Jerks and Profar for Austin Allen. Look, Austin Allen's blocked. You know, you've got Francisco Mejia there and Luis Camposano in there and Austin Hedges is still there, who, by the way, just happens to be the by far. And I'm not talking about a little bit. I'm talking about and they, they're they able to actually qualify or to quantify that uh, uh, statistically now in regards to pitch framing. And he is by far. There's nobody close. In fact, I think you can take the next two, second to third uh, in all of baseball. And he's still number one ahead of them. He's, he's, he's that good of a pitch framer. Uh, so, I mean, in, in regards to that, we'll see what happens. You know, Austin Allen is not the future of, as a catcher now, but he's a guy who could go to the American league and hit well. So I think uh, that, uh, getting jerks and pro far, who is a guy that uh, AJ Preller has coveted for a long time. He's worked with him. Uh, there's always been talk about bringing him in and, and look, he had a down year average wise, but if he, I think if he could get back to 2018, uh, you know, I think, uh, I don't think he's the long-term answer at second base, but I think he's certainly uh, an upgrade over Ian Kinsler. Good grief. And, and, you know, the last, last one, you know, look, Luis Arias is, you know, always been packed full of potential. That's never been the question, but the Brewers traded him to play shortstop, something he doesn't do well. Anyway, he's a second baseman. He's not a shortstop and he's been super inconsistent at the plate as well. I mean, you know, I know he was highly rated uh, still even to this point, but I think Luis and I wish all the best for him, but he's still got a ton to prove, but I think this would be a, one of those situations where, I mean, look, you've got uh, Trent Grishman. We all know how it ended last year, but he's another guy uh, that I think has an opportunity to really benefit uh, from a change of scenery. And and now all of a sudden you, you, you go in that outfield uh, from Hunter Renfro, who, who made some nice defensive plays, you know, and then who knows where you look at Will Myers or maybe Manny Margot, however they want to do it. But all I know is now that outfield has Tommy Pham and Taylor. Uh, so Tommy Pham and Trent Grisham, all of a sudden they got pretty darn athletic, you know? So I'm okay with everything that they've done so far. And by the way, if you think that AJ Preller is done, you're crazy. He's going to do a lot more. This is just the start. They're, this team is going to start moving some of its uh, some of those pieces. That you don't want to stay the top ranked farm system for too long. You know what I mean, Chris? Because then that's all you are—just prospects. Yeah. Um. Two quick questions you know, for you. Some of them. Some of them are graduates. Thing in in 2020, and you know or plus of them, and it's time to move some of those pieces. Jerkson Profar was, what, the number one prospect in baseball, what, like four years ago, five years ago? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, I didn't, did not play well last year. had like a .8 war uh, over a full season of full-time duty. So, uh, when yeah. you do that. Yeah, at, he was not good. Yeah, when you're doing that at 25, that's a little bit of a, a yellow flag at least, but sometimes those guys have late breakouts. It's probably a, a gamble worth taking. He wasn't too expensive. And it's other people's money. Um, right, that's the great – I'm glad you said that because that keep, that statement keeps coming up more and more on baseball and cir- in baseball circles when it right. comes to free agency spending and things like that. They say, well, of course you want to spend. It's not your money. Spend it. Yeah, just spend it till you can't spend anymore. That's yeah, that well, that comes up on our board too, and that's a. I think that's that's a garbage argument uh, for a number of reasons. We could do a whole podcast on that, but um, okay. And remind me, we we will one day. All right. Baseball Hall of Fame this weekend. The uh, what do they call it? The the Modern Era Committee or whatever is going to put in up to four, I think is what they can go to. What do you think happens? I, you know, honestly, Chris, who, 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 who's, who's the possibility here? I can't believe I'm having to tell you this. Um, Oh, well, oh, well, man. Well, you guess what? You're having to tell me. Well, no, I mean, you're usually, that, that was not, that was not unintentionally condescending. I'm just saying you're usually right on top of these. Um, the list is Dwight Evans, Steve Garvey, Tommy John, D- 
Don Mattingly, Thurman Munson, Dale Murphy, Dave Parker, Ted Simmons, Lou Whitaker, and Marvin Miller. So what do you think happens? They named Harold Baines and Lee Smith got in on this last year. Was Jack Morris last year? It was either last year or the year before that. It wouldn't have been any earlier than that, I don't think. That wasn't all that long ago, for sure. The, the reason I ask is because that how many they they let in last year may influence the answer here. But I okay, have, yeah, you're right. I have put that list. Um, I'm trying man, to. The, the reason I say is, is I, I want to know how many they let in last year. Cause, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if my list would change anyway. I think I'm going to make a prediction about what they'll do, and I want to hear yours before. Before I get mine, okay, because I, I, I promise you, I will give you mine regardless of whatever you say. Uh, okay, operating uh, under the assumption that they they used all four, uh, or, or no, what do you think? No, the you don't have to operate right. under okay. that assumption. Okay. That's and that's why I was asking how many they let in last year, uh, because maybe that will influence your answer. Okay, now understanding that having this conversation with you, I'm sitting in my recliner on a Friday night and I don't have a thing in front of me. So I'm not really going to be able to argue with you because I don't have that or any of those in front of me, just based upon the people that you just mentioned. Uh, it's crazy, and you're going to think, why would that be the first person? But of that list that you mentioned, man, I'm a big fan. Even though he broke my heart when I was a boy, Chris, he broke my heart when I was 12 or 13 years old. <sighs> Man, I just and, and then and I'm getting away from the stats and I'm getting more into the emotional side of things. Uh, I, there were very few better did it better than Sweet Lou. You know what I mean? I was a big Lou Whitaker fan, so admittedly, for me, that name's going up there. You know, and and that may not even be right statistically. I don't know where he stands, but he was even still to this day. I still think about watching that dude play. I love Lou Whitaker. Love Lou Whitaker. I think he certainly uh, fit that mit, that mil, uh, mold. Uh, another player who was a dominant player in my childhood in that generation when we were boys, even growing up in Houston. You know, if you played this position, he was one of the guys that you uh, that you so emulated. You know, if, if we were playing a game and you, you were in that position, I'm this guy he ended up playing tell you his name because i'll just give you one clue he had the biggest forearms i've ever seen on a baseball player does, does that tell you who it is dave parker no steve garvey oh yeah yeah he uh, had those two steve garvey had three trucks for forearms man he looked like popeye you know and he just had that smile, that you know, that gleam, little smile, little smirk he had all the time. Uh, just let you know he was in charge of things. I, so, you know, as far as a prediction, I have no idea from a statistical standpoint. But for me, if I were in there and I decided that we were going to just go to this time around, uh, uh, again, I'm. you can pick me to death. I don't care. Those two names are getting to the top of the list for me. Did you say Don Mattingly was in there too? Yeah, I believe I did. Yeah, he he's another man. That that dude just knew how to hit, man. The dude, I love dudes that just rake. You know, that just know how to put that ball in play, and you know, and and get on base. And he he was guys like him and Wade Boggs. You know, of course, my favorite player of all time, Till Fernando Tatis, came along. Uh, Tony Gwynn, uh, Ichiro, guys who just knew how to get on base. Man, I love guys like that. So talk to me about the two guys that I've picked and, and, and how far off my, I am on this and how different I am from you. Okay, uh, first of all, I've looked this up, and I think last year they let in Baines and Lee Smith. I could not remember if George Steinbrenner got in. I don't think he did. I think he was actually deserving too. But um, anyway. What's the criteria for for an owner? I don't know. I mean, what's the what's the criteria for a player rep? Um, 
this is this is what I think. Okay, this these are my predictions. Lou Whitaker was my first. His really? wins above cool. replacement score is off the charts at seventy five and change, which is really high for a guy not in the Hall of Fame. Now I am, you know, I'm a big stats guy. I am. I'm a little little skeptical on war until I kind of know more about how that's made. I don't understand that, especially defensively. I I question sometimes how good war is with defense. I don't know that that's a valid question, but it's one I don't have answered. So there's that. My prediction is Lou Whitaker, Dale Murphy, Ted Simmons, and Marvin Miller. Lou, Lou Whitaker. Whitaker, um, no, I feel I, the I, best about uh, just because war is so pervasive now. And that is a that is an exceptionally high score. Murphy, I think they're going to go back to – he won two MVPs. War did not see him as a good defensive player, as a center fielder, but he won five gold gloves there. Dale Murphy in the mid-'80s was considered by a lot of people the best player in baseball. Uh, and if they let Harold Baines in last year, I have to think everybody, anybody who picked between Murphy and Baines, that was not even a question. So uh, Ted you know, Simmons, I'm and, thinking, and I'm thinking catchers are going to get more love as it goes on. He had 2,500 hits. That's an awful lot for a catcher. And Marvin Miller, um, man, I, I think I've said this. I've read his book. It is one of the best books I've ever read about sports. It is not well known. It is unbelievable, that story, and what he went through with the Players Association. And, and I don't mean to take sides on this um, from a political sense at all or anything like that, but you just cannot deny his impact on the game and how much he changed the game for the better. And he should have been in a decade ago. You know, I was thinking about something that you you were saying about Harold Baines. You know, I'm not going to go uh, say something stupid like they didn't do Harold Baines a favor by electing him to the Baseball Hall of Fame. I mean, come on, I don't know how that could ever be the case, but but now he is forever going to be that guy. Every time this conversation comes up and there's people on the fence who don't, you know, it's always going to come back to, but Harold Baines got in. Really good baseball player. Really good baseball player. Is he a Hall of Famer? I mean, in name, absolutely. I mean, he's there. He's in. It's, it's not going to be undone. He's in. But that really sucks in my mind. Not to be a look, you make a baseball hall of fame, life is good. But it sucks that a really good career is going to be ridiculed because it probably got somewhere that it probably shouldn't have been. Yes. And, and I don't like that for him. And I don't like that for Harold. Agreed. Agreed. The only way I know how to put that. Well, I will be interested. I don't know that I would vote for Dale Murphy, and he was my favorite player ever. So I will be beyond thrilled if he gets in. And I don't I don't know that I don't know that he's undeserving. I just the, the stats on him are so mixed. It's the fielding thing in war that kills him. And that goes completely at odds with what people thought at the time, which Maybe they were wrong. I don't know. It's just that's the thing about war that fascinates me is how it can completely contradict what people see with their eyes on the fielding element. And that's really given me a lot of pause with that metric. I don't know if, if they also overweight certain positions or underweight others. Uh, like I said, I would, I would. That's back to the whole I'd like to know how war is made thing. But Murphy to me is going to be interesting. I think that. The other thing with him, too, is in an era where everything about baseball was tarnished for a 20- or 30-year period, I think he's the one guy that you could say with certainty, if you could say it about anybody, if there was one superstar who didn't cheat, 
I think he'd be number one on just about everybody's list. And at a time where you had the Bonds and the Clemenses that did so much damage to baseball, you had the player strike right after he was out. You know, if there was ever a guy that was a goodwill ambassador for baseball for a while, he was it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Hey, look, I, I know we're wrapping it up, but I just saw this. Someone just posted this. A reporter just reported this on Twitter when we were talking about the Padres trade uh, just a minute ago, uh, excluding prospects because they – Traded Austin Allen away, traded Xavier, uh, traded Xavier Edwards away, and they received one. So leaving the prospect side of things out, uh, the additions of Drew Pomerant, Zach Davies, Trent Grisham, Tommy Pham, and Jerkson Profar, or those are the additions. The subtractions are Luis Arias, Eric Lauer, Travis Jankowski, and Hunter Renfro. What do you think the war is on that? But it says a combined what war before AJ Preller gets to the winter meetings. What do you think it is? You mean the net? Yes. Okay, they lost Urias and who else? Lauer, Jankowski, and Renfro. And they added Pomerantz, Davies, Grisham, Pham, and Profar. Okay, well. That's kind of an unfair question because most of those guys didn't play much at all. But uh, plus 15? Whoa, Lord, no. <laughs> plus 15? Man, no, no, no. Plus 3.7. Oh, okay. Well, wait a minute. What was fam? Yeah. What do you mean? What was Fam? Well, was I guess Fam, I guess Fam's the only guy who had much in Pom because Pomeranz didn't do much. Yeah, that was a that was a ridiculous guess. Um, I mean, Arias didn't play much at all last whoa, whoa, year. Whoa, whoa, Jankowski whoa, whoa, was hurt whoa, whoa, the whole whoa, whoa, year. Did you say Pomeranz didn't do much last year? <sighs> you need to look at the last half of the season. He was as dominant as there was in the league. He was an absolute monster for Milwaukee at the end of the season last year. I mean, okay, a, I, look, he may, have got, he may have got a little too much money, you know, from San Diego. I think it was four or thirty six or something like that. But uh, he 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 was pure filth. Okay, I, I, I he, he struggled the first half of the season mightily. Uh, he absolutely he, he there. That's why he's getting paid right now. Okay. And Zach Davies. Zach Davies is a solid pitcher. He's a very solid. Zach Davies had what I think a three five five dollar last season. Okay, I'm like, how did I miss well, okay, he only threw twenty six innings in Milwaukee. So that's how I missed it. Um and for San Fran, well, and for well, for San Fran, he was awful, and that's what I was thinking. Yes, he, and he and he, he was, was but wretched he was for the for the Giants. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, he's, he's got he, a he's got a career four ninety four ERA. So yes, plus you know, but remember, I mean, it, it is one thing that it was abundantly clear is his move to the pen worked for him big time. Yeah, I mean that that's fine. I'm not I, mean, I remember him at Ole Miss. I remember Tim Corbin used to just rave about him. I'm sorry, four oh four. I can't read my eyes are going on me as I get older. I hope people like baseball because, because if they're still tuned in, they do. <laughs> oh, well, you better, man. Don't you don't don't give up on us just yet. We got all kinds of interesting stuff. We're just getting started. This podcast isn't halfway halfway over yet. <laughs> no, that is not true. Because I don't need sleep. <laughs> that, is, that is not true. Because we're about to wrap this joint up, son. Yeah. Um, no, it's it's. I like people know that we're both. I'm a big baseball guy. Um, and you and I usually do this when you've got about an hour. So we we were unbound by time tonight. Well, no, that does not happen very often. So I am very glad that that is the case. Although I'm not sure at 10 o'clock at night, my mind is as sharp as it is at three in the afternoon. So anyway, I'd say it's about the same. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you're great. 
<laughs> it's it's debatably not very good at three most days either. So uh, it's sharp as a tack, sir. You're the man. Um, give your Twitter handle, your station, all the things so people can find you on social media and so they can listen to your show. That's probably the thing to do. I think that's a good move. You can find me online at Twitter at, at Cheap Seats Bass. Find me at WNWS.com and on the dial at 101.5 in Jackson, Tennessee from 6 to 8, Monday through Friday. He is Seabass. I'm Chris Levy, host of the Vandy Sports Podcast. Thank you for listening. We'll come back for more episodes next week.